All right, I'll turn it over to you, John. Okay. <clears throat> okay, this is slide 68. We talked about this last week, but it's worth a quick review. And that is that the same pattern which defines the Enoch year, which is showing on the screen now, also defines the great year of 364 years instead of 364 days. And it uses what I call the day-year pattern, uh, counting years as days. And so this is going to be true of, of basically all of the calendars. I haven't got it figured out for all of them, but there's evidence that every one of them has the, the same pattern with which you count a year. Like this is this this is how you count an Enoch year. This is what's being shown in four quarters of of ninety one days each. You count years the same way. So I'll go to slide sixty nine. One of the key things in doing that <clears throat> is that uh, you know one of the most important years is what I mean is the year in, in which Christ is born in one BC. Uh, he's born just after the beginning of an Enoch great year of 364 years. And so the day, the first day of a year is always a Sunday called what Sunday one spring. So the name of that whole year is Sunday one spring and it's written in capital letters. So when you see dates written in capital letters, they refer to years instead of days in my work. That's my way to distinguish. So those two, I believe, are both review. So now go to 70 and we'll start new things. Oh, this slide I just sort of throw in. It needs to be somewhere. This seemed like a good place. But just in the way years are counted, in the ADBC, system there's no year zero uh that's a little confusing at first because we're used to a zero but in roman numerals and in many ancient cultures they didn't have a concept of zero and if you learn roman numerals there's no zero in roman numerals for instance so which makes it really hard to do arithmetic just that one problem that one thing so the year preceding AD 1 was 1 BC. Now astronomers don't like that because they like to be able to just subtract. If you know, anyway, they, they renamed 1 BC to be AD 0 and 2 BC to be AD minus 1. So now they put a zero into it and it shifts all of the years before Christ by one. In all of my papers, I use the BC because that's what people are used to. But you, you, it makes it hard. If you want to know the age of Jesus when he's baptized, and he's uh, baptized in AD 29 and born in 1 BC, uh, you can't just subtract the two numbers. You get the wrong answer. But if you change it to AD zero, you get the right answer. 29 minus zero is 29. And the Savior was actually 29 and a half, which the scriptures say he's just beginning to be age 30. Uh, they uh, round up. Usually they, they round to the nearest year in scriptures often. Anyway, just be aware that there's no year zero BC. That can be confusing. Okay. Go to number 71. So this is, <clears throat> this is really interesting. Uh, there's two prophecies in the book of Enoch of the whole history of the world. In, uh, in, in, in DNC 107, it's revealed that Adam was given a prophecy where he, when, when he was old, he stood up and said all the things that would happen during the main history of the world, and that Enoch was the scribe and wrote them down. It doesn't use the word scribe there, but it, it's all through other ancient works. He's the, he's the secretary of the quorum. 
if you will, <clears throat> where Adam was the president. And that's in there. But besides that, that's in the book of the regular book of Enoch, which got taken out of the Bible. Um, there's also what's called Enoch's 10 week prophecy, where Enoch says that the earth will last 10, what he calls weeks, or what got translated weeks. And then he says what will happen in each one. And I did a lot of research on that, and I'm really pretty confident of the answer. And that is what he calls a week is actually two Enoch great years. So instead of 364, they're all 728. And if you take 10 sets of 728 years, that's multiplied by 10, just add a zero, it's 7,280 years. And that's equal to just basically the 7,000 years of history plus a little season of, of 280. So here's just a quick summary. If you do that and start it right in counting back from when Christ is born, or counting back to when a, a Enoch year would start, it would be 4004 BC. I mean, minus 4004. See, here's, ah, that's why I showed you the last slide. I want to use the minus system here so you can see the symmetry. Just look at it, and you can see there's a plus year 364 and a minus. And a plus 1820, hello, that's when Joseph Smith has the first vision, and a minus 1820. So that's the beauty of the plus and minus system. It's to see the numbers and the symmetry and the chiasm, if you will. And notice that's centered right on the birth of Christ. This 10-week this, this ten ten prophecy centers the zero is at six and a half units out of 10. Uh, and that results in each of these, when each of these weeks starts uh, being right on multiples of great years. But just a quick look at that. Uh, in the first week, he says when he's born, he says he's born on such and, in such and such a day of the first week. And his birthday is, was as well known in my work. It really stands out. And sure enough, that fits this pattern. I think he's the seventh week, seventh day of the first week or something like that. And um, that fits. And then in the next week is when Adam dies and Enoch is translated. I forget. Uh, I, I'm not really summarizing what is prophesied here. I'm, I'm, this is what's prophesied, but I'm trying to cram it all in one slide. And so I don't have the exact words down. But basically, the flood is predicted. Uh, Enoch had a lot of visions of the flood. And, I mean, he was, these were nightmares for him and tough time sleeping when he saw what was going on. And that's when Abraham and Israel come up. Minus 1820 is, uh, I've got Genesis, it's when the, there's something in the prophecy that seems to imply that it's when Moses will be given the book of Genesis as, as a history and the Bible is started. And they go to the promised land. House of David and the house of God are in the next week. And then the re resurrection and dispersion are in the next week from minus 364 up to plus. Uh, the, oh, the sevenfold doctrine. Yeah, that's interesting. I got a whole paper on that. Um, it's in the New Testament, and, and let's not talk about it now, but it's something that was prophesied and it's there, but we haven't studied much as a people. Uh, the America, America and the Reformation is, I think, clearly predicted. It says there that uh, people will escape from the bondage and slavery they've been in. And it's referring a lot to the slavery of, of Catholic Catholicism uh, and religion. And, uh, and that's where the people that come to America were escaping 
they were coming for religious freedom. And so the founding of the country and the Reformation tie in to what's prophesied for the eight. The neat thing for the LDS people is the opening day of the next week in 1820, the opening day is Sunday, the March 26th of 1820. That opening day is the day of the first vision. And so, uh, that's really slick. This was prophesied way back in the days of uh, Enoch, in the days of Adam. And it's prophesied that the two big things, uh, the truth will, will, it doesn't say spring from the earth, but it's something like that, will come forth, and then the whole destruction of the wicked happens in this 728 year period. And then uh, the last period includes the final judgment at the end of the millennium. And then it even says that after the 10 weeks are over, that's when there's a new heaven. And that scriptures say there'll be a new heaven and a new earth at the end of that. So anyway, it's pretty exciting that to me that this prophecy can be understood when you understand the Enoch calendar and wait, what? Sec. Okay, I just thought I'd look at my, at least look at my phone to make sure it wasn't you people phoning me or something. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, but anyway, the amazing thing is out of a, 10 things prophesied for the whole, his, whole history of the earth, <coughs> the restoration is right there. The first vision as the opening event on the first day. I was just astounded. This, uh, this was discovered long after I had found through other means the, uh, first day, the date of the first vision. So this was, you know, cherry on the Sunday or something. Anyway, uh, you can go to the next slide, but uh, it's just exciting that this is all, all there. Okay. Oh, oh, here I go into detail. I forgot I had this slide. Now I'm, I remember this course that I'm teaching is not for LDS people. Uh, it's for just Christians in general. So I rarely, I don't. I think I've ever mentioned Joseph Smith. So I'm just, I'm just telling them that we're in the last days, basically. So we are now in the seventh great year, uh, or the seven-year great feast of tabernacles of the first great year of the ninth week. <laughs> this is tricky, of Enoch's ten-week prophecy of sacred events. So, in the last slide, we saw that the first vision was the opening of the ninth week. But now, let's count it out to where we are. Uh, so, the New Year's Day, the Holy Day, now becomes an entire year of the day. Of, the day is one spring in small letters, and the year is one spring in capital letters. And that is when a prophet is called. Now, see, I'm add nine years to 1820 and you get 1829 and then add nine days and you come to the year 10 spring in the day 10 spring by adding nine days and the year 10 spring by adding nine years. You see how they're counting a year as a day. That would be called consecration because that holy day 10 spring is a holy day called consecration. That's when you choose the lamb and you choose something. That is the day that Oliver Cowdery uh, began as a scribe for Joseph Smith. So he shows up on the 5th, on Sunday the 5th, and starts actually being a scribe. So that's right on this calendar. And I've got down, he called a scribe on that day. Passover is going to be in, in the year 14 spring on the day 14 spring, 
That's Saturday, the 6th of April, 1833. That is the, that is the day they held general conference down in Zion, in Missouri. The first conference of the church in Missouri, I believe it was the first one. They first went there in 1831, but they were just getting started. But the whole church went there, not just the people that started it. And uh, I've identified that as what looks like the day the kingdom was born. Uh, I don't have a lot of proof for that, but it looks like that's, this is a day of birth. This is, this is Passover. See, so consecration, you choose the lamb. Passover is the day of the, uh, the feast. And then seven years later, 1840, is the last day of Passover in the year 21 spring. And um, I've got cut midweek. I'm not sure what I meant by cut midweek. Um, oh, cut midweek. Uh, halfway through that week is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the, some of the scriptures talk about things ending in the middle of the week. So not much happened in 1840. But the middle of that week would have been 1836 in October. Anyway, 1836 was the big vision of uh, the Lord appearing in the temple in Kirtland. And anyway, I don't have too much down for what happened on that day. But now here's what's cool in our time. Now you wait to the other half of the year, 102 182 years later, at 182 to 1820, one eight, eight and two is going to be zero, eight one's nine and 2000. It's going to be um, September of 2001 is going to be, <clears throat> oh, it's 2001 instead of two because it starts in the autumn before these, these days do. So on the, the one autumn, one hour, one autumn, is the Feast of Trumpets, a hundred, in other words, this is half of a great year later, 182 years later. And it's Sunday two, two thirds, and that's, that's right at the time of Twin Towers in September of 2001. It's not on the, on the exact day, but that was a big event that's starting something going on. Uh, the Day of Atonement would be in, uh, in 2010. This is the time Denver starts. <clears throat> He's, first, the first books have come out, and we're all being told to turn to God, which you do on the Day of Atonement. Saturday, the 4th of October, 2014. 2014 is when he gave the 10th lecture, 2013 to 14. He's just finished the whole 10 lectures. And he's just said we should all go out and start fellowship, be rebaptized, and start fellowships. And that's right at a time that's the Feast of Tabernacles, which is uh, a full week, which means seven years of rejoicing and uh, beginning. I've got the new house is begun and the house is done. And I sort of am hinting around that it's not only the house of the, the family of God as a household that's being baptized, but that may also be the temple. See, tabernacles refers to temple. And so this would be a time to be, you know, building a new temple is what it looks like. It's a time for tabernacles. So bodies being baptized and temple. So isn't that cool? Uh, I wrote a whole paper somewhere saying <clears throat> this, if you look at this, and, and, I, and other days, this is just the Enoch calendar. If you look at the other calendars, the Hebrew, they, they do the same thing. And it, you can see the time that this servant called David is supposed to show up. And it's right, it's right in these years. And so this is the time. In my paper, I said, uh, Somebody called David the servant should show up in this period and he should have these qualifications. And I said, the only one I know that's even a candidate is 
David uh, is, is Denver Snuffer. And I, and in the paper, I say, is there anybody else? I did get one letter back in from somebody saying there is somebody else named David. And he started around the same time and he had all the qualifications. And, you know, the Lord has told us that if we mess up, he'll still, he's, his work will not be stopped or interfered with. And he'll go to another people. So he might have some backup Davids around somewhere, all going at the same time. And if we all make it, then we all might join together. I don't know. But I was really surprised to get an email. It was back in the Midwest somewhere, in, in Kansas area or somewhere. There's, there's another David that's uh, trying to do something similar. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully, we as a people can get our act together and not be rejected outright. Okay, next next slide. Well, I, well I'll save questions, think of questions and ask them, ask them later. Uh, oh, this is one where I just thought I'd, I hadn't made my little table of contents at the bottom of the page yet where you can just instantly go to anything. So this I just used for a table of contents to where we are now. So we are now going to start the Venus calendar on the next slide. So let's go to slide 74. So here we are. Now this is really a cool calendar. And I, we may, well, I was going to say we may not finish it tonight. We may not even get hardly started. It's almost time to go to questions. But let's just see if we can get off the ground. Venus calendar is derived in my work from Native American traditions of the importance of the cycles of Venus. So they had a lot of traditions and vague things. I'm going to present a precise calendar. Um, I don't claim that they used this calendar. I believe this is the real calendar, and it was probably shown back to the Nephites. And it just has been, the details have been lost over time. Or maybe they never had the details. The scriptures say that new things will be revealed about all of this in this dispensation. So I don't know how much they had. But I do know I based it on their traditions. So let's just go to a couple of slides and see. Next slide, 75. Uh, oh, this is to get you... This is my puzzle of the day to get people thinking. How many, and it sounds like it's trivial, and it's not. There's a huge principle, and this is tricky. How many times in 12 hours do the hands line up on a clock, the big and the little hands? And you'd say, well, gee, really, it was, should ought to be 12, right? Because they line up at noon, and then basically at 5 after 1, they line up, and at 10 after 2, they line up. So most people will say, well, obviously, any fool can see, provided he is a fool, that the answer is 12. My boss used to say that. Uh, and I love that saying. Uh, so let's do it carefully and not just jump to that conclusion. And if you do, in fact, before we go to the slide, I'll just say how to do it carefully. They don't line up at five after one. It's a little bit more than five after one. It's like a half, a, nearly at six after one. And they line up again, not at 10 after two, because at 10 after two, the little hand is moved past the two, right? If the big hand's pointing at the two, the little hand is, has gone one sixth of the way toward the three. So there, it's really going to be at least at 211 something like that that they line up if you do that all the way around go to the next slide 76 well let's get the answer here um here's one way to do it without having to do all the fractions and the exact time of each lineup this is a almost most math problems if you think of it in a clever way there's a certain perspective and if you have that clever perspective it becomes trivial. And it's just a matter of knowing how to look at it. And here's the way to look at this problem. How many times in 12 hours do the hands line up? The big hand, in 12 hours, 
how many times does it go around? It goes around 12 times, right? It completes, think of them as two racers, going, two men racing around the clock. The big hand goes around 12 times. The small hand in 12 hours only goes around once. So the big hand passes or, or laps, as you say in a, in a race, he lapped him. Um, the big hand passes the small one 11 times. And so the answer is 11. They, they line up 11 times. And the way to see this is there's no time during 11 o'clock. It's five after one, and then it's 30, 7.35, 8.40, 9.45, 10.50, but now it's 10.50, almost 11, and 11, the time for 11 should be something like 11.55, but it's actually a little beyond that, and it's 12, and so there's no time in the 11th hour that they line up. It goes from 10.55 up to 12. So anyway, now why is that important? Go to slide 77. That is important because that is gonna be the basis of all of the planetary calendars. They're visible from a moving Earth. So you take the planet Venus. The planet Venus, I'm going to read the lower part first. It orbits the sun 13 times, while the Earth orbits eight times. And, and that time is, the Earth orbiting eight times is what we call eight years, right? So in eight years, Venus goes around faster, actually goes around 13 times. If you look up in a regular astronomy table, it'll say, oh yeah, the orbital period of Venus is like 225 days. And see, that means it can go around 13 times before we go around eight. But the Venus calendar is set up for when the Earth pa passes Venus, or or Venus passes the Earth, it's going faster, when they line up into the sun like this. When they line up like this, and when do they line up next? That is called the Venus cycle. So Venus passes the sun five times. It's just like the other problem. The other problem, the answer was, when, when the numbers were 12 and 1, you just subtract them. 12 minus 1 is 11. Here you just subtract them. Again, Venus goes 13 times while the Earth goes eight times. That means Venus will pass the Earth five times every eight years. So the length of a Venus cycle is one-fifth of eight years, which is 584 days. So look, look at the huge difference. In, in your astronomy book, it'll say the orbital period of Venus is 224 or 25 days, right in that period, right in that length. I think it's 224.7. Uh, and yet the time from Venus being lining up for the sun is a long time. That's 1.6 years, uh, 584 days. And that is almost nowhere in any astronomy book. And this is the one that is the basis of the Venus calendar. So that was a little bit of math there. Go ahead to the next slide. But I tried to make the math really easy. Two racers, the guy going 13 times passes, the one guy going eight times, five times. That's that simple. And they won't show it that way in a book, by the way. They do the problem and it's a bunch of math and nobody ever understands it. I used to teach it. Okay, and maybe you still don't, but hey, I tried. Uh, number 78. Now, in this picture, not only is the sun fixed like you expect, but the earth in this picture is also fixed, and that's because on the Venus cycle, oh, it's time to stop. We'll, we'll pick this up next time. I forgot the time. Um, but in the Venus cycle, it's like when the earth and the sun line up, it's... It's considered like the Earth is fixed. That's why this is all based on the Earth as if the Earth were fixed. You, you do a rotating frame. We'll start on 78 next time. Let's stop and, and uh, now take some questions for the last 15 minutes. Uh, and I don't believe I've received any 
in the email. So you can just ask them now if, uh, oh, and maybe I should look, I'll be smart and I'll click on the chat button and see if there's anything there. Okay, I don't see anything there. So somebody do something if they want to ask a question. Hey, John. Yes. So why do you suppose that the Lord asked Denver to, to give 10 talks? What do you think the symbolic meaning of, would that be like atonement, a day atonement on 10 days? Or what would you think that that oh, that's could possibly mean? Yeah, that's Rather than 12 or seven. Yeah, it's, I, 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 I'm not gonna know. Uh, I only know the meaning of some of the numbers. I know what the traditional meanings say, but see, I have to find out for myself if everything's right. Um, and I've been working with all these numbers. I'll tell you some of the numbers that I know best because I've just been doing the star calendar and the number of, of a whole of stars in every constellation is very meaningful. Seven is the number for a complete man, for, for a complete being. And six is incomplete. Eight has to do with resurrection. All the resurrection things have eight stars. And 12, 12 has to do with judgment. Uh, all the people that are judging, uh, the scorpion's a judge. Uh, Adam is a judge. Uh, I'm trying to say Adam. Uh, the dragon has 12 stars. There's only one that has 10 stars, and it's Boodes, the herdsman, the, the good shepherd, has 10. <laughs> okay. Well, and, that would fit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They called him the Good Shepherd back in the Euphrates, ancient Babylon, not not 600 BC, ancient Sumeria type Babylon. The name of that constellation was the Good Shepherd. Uh, that one has ten stars, and but see, I can't. I do patterns, and if I just have one that has ten, it's I, not. It's not a great any conclusion. Right, I can't, I can't say much. So, my real answer is going to be I don't know, but uh, I will say that all the numbers are almost always important. Hey, John, this is Glenn. Yes. Hey, um, according to patterns in Scripture too, if you look in the pattern, anytime there's a ten, there's always a period of testing or proving. Oh, well, there you go. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. The Ten Commandments, tithing is, is related to ten, the ten virgins. And so, yeah, you do the keyword search, and you'll always see ten aligns oh, very with good. it. That, that could well be true. That's fine. I have found yep. that. That's good. And, and the, shepherd, the shepherd keeping uh, track of the sheep, I mean, that could tie into that, too very easily so so there could be a 40 year period right a four into four times ten the 40 is a period of testing so that make would make sense that 40 would be divisible by 10. yeah that could be uh the secret to all of these is to find enough examples i don't publish anything till i've got three if i try to follow this rule uh three examples that are somehow clearly not just random. I mean, three nice solid examples, and then I'll publish it. But when I just have one, uh, I, I, it's too iffy. So I, I wait till I have, and the, and the Lord, I'll tell you this, the Lord really sticks to his two or three witness rule. Um, he does that. In fact, in fact, uh, uh, here's a quick story on that. Uh, my, uh, when I first sent my paper to the ensign on the date of the resurrection of Christ, way back in, I sent it back in 1982. And wait a minute, let me not take that. Um, and they finally published it in 1985. And afterwards, I went to the editor and I said, I was totally unknown. You had no idea who I was. Why did you publish my paper? And he took it on as a challenge because he had to go against the correlation committee. Uh, 
who, who doesn't like to publish anything new because they, you know, they don't know. And so I said, why was that? And he said, oh, very simple. He said, we use the, uh, the rule of two or three witnesses. And I said, yeah, so? And he said, well, you were not the, you were not the first witness. He said, somebody else wrote a paper. Somebody else wrote a paper on the date of the resurrection, and they had exactly the same date you did, Sunday, April 3rd, AD 33. And so you were the second witness, and when we read them, we liked yours better. And, and they were going to try to do a joint one, but it turned out they decided just to do mine. But, but he said, if we just get a paper on a subject, we just put it in a file and wait for a second witness. And we don't do it otherwise. So I said, wow, you mean you really take that seriously? And he said, yes, <laughs> we really do. So there you go. And by the way, while well, somebody thinks of another question, I have just a quick one that I wanted to throw in. Uh, that's not a question as much as a quick story. Um, on how the Lord, how to deal with the Lord and how I'm learning to. And uh, from what I can tell from the scriptures, the Lord does this a lot with everybody. But I had it just this week. And I'll do the short version. It's actually kind of a long story. But the short version is, there's something that I had been shown was true, but I, I can never publish a paper and say I was shown it. I've told you that before. I, I don't do that. I'm not into claiming I'm getting revelation. So, so I prayed and said, look, that's all nice. That's great. I, I have a warm, fuzzy feeling, but I need a solid. <laughs> I need something. Yeah, I I need a some. You know, I need something solid, or I can't. Sure. And it was in the paper, by the way, that came out this last Tuesday. It was already done. The paper had been written, and this was coming as a correction. And now it was a correction that needed something solid. So I said. So I prayed for that. Now often I will just get an answer. And I, the point of the story is, I could have just gotten an answer. The Lord could have just told me. But he didn't. He had me do this stupid, inane, cra <laughs> crazy thing. And I'll even tell you what it was. The word seagoat uh, is the Capricorn is not just a goat. Capricorn is half fish and half goat. And, and he's, the English term is seagoat. Well, it just suddenly occurred to me is, should that be hyphenated or not? And when I thought about it, yeah, it's got to be hyphenated. In other words, like sea monster, no, seahorse, no. Why? Because it's really a monster that lives in the sea. You don't need to hyphenate that. It's an adjective. But sea goat is half goat and half fish. And it just sent me that it has to be hyphenated. And then it... The inspiration comes and says, you have to change all of your papers right now and make them all consistent and just put in hyphens on all of them. And I said, wait a minute. I'm, you know, of course, I always whine and argue, you know. <laughs> I, I said, wait a minute. I'm trying to get this paper done. I can do that after. And the voice said, no, you will never do it after. You will never think it's important <laughs> enough. Go correct, go correct them all right now or it'll never happen. I said, well, that's true. Okay. So what do I do? I go off and correct the papers. And guess what? When I get to one of them, and it's way back 2001, that I've forgotten, I guess, what I wrote. And when I'm correcting the word in that paper, just to put a hyphen, and I don't, I don't mind doing little corrections of typos and stuff in old papers. And I put in the hyphen, and I read the paragraph there, and it said, it is prophesied, well, and now I'm giving you details. Let's just say the answer is there with a no, spear. No, keep giving details. <laughs> well, the, the, the details are that there's a spear. The, 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 it's the savior is the goat. It's a goat because he appears to be evil. And they, they sacrifice the goat who appears to be evil, but it's really the savior. It's when he's being crucified. Well, there's a spear in the picture. Nobody has a spear in the picture of the sea goat. And in this way paper way back, I said that it looks like there's going to be a spear in it. And then I had the paper in 2016 where I had a whole paper on it, and I called it a thorn in his side. 
I had one star set up, uh, a chosen, to be the thorn, because that's what the Greeks had. They said this is a thorn. That's how it was translated. So I had one star. Now I'm learning all the secrets of the star calendar, and it has to be two stars. And I saw what the two stars are and where the spear is. And it's actually a, a spear pointing up, just like a soldier would do, up into the sea goat, into the sacrifice. Okay, I, when I find this hyphenated word sea goat, it says, I, quote, I, I have the answer right there. And it says, in, in, Je, Je, in Jacob's prophecy, to he gave each of his 12 children in chapter 49 of Genesis. He says that Levi and, and Simeon are brethren, and in their habitations are instruments of cruelty. Now, Levi is Pisces, the fishes, and if you do the traditional way, they're tied by either chains or by ropes by their tails to the sea monster. If you do it the way Denver has said that it should be, it's a net. But if you're a fish being caught by a net, that's sort of an instrument of cruelty. I think it works either way. There's an instrument of cruelty in Levi's house. But there's nothing in the traditional picture of the sea goat. There's no instruments of cruelty. There's now a spear. There's a spear in his. So that's right in the scripture. The, there, the scripture says there has to be some kind of instrument of cruelty in Capricorn. And so there it is. There's a prophecy that has it way back at the time of Jacob. And, and these astronomers tend to take this stuff out. And, and the Greeks, uh, the woman that's, uh, and now we're almost over, but the woman that's the, the virgin maiden, she has the, the seed in her hand, which is Christ. And all the pictures show that. You look in Ptolemy's table, he never mentions the seed. He doesn't mention the branch in her other hand. He doesn't, they take out all the stuff, like the, 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 sword, the swords. Uh, Perseus doesn't have a sword, and yet he's supposed to have a sword. Um, they tend to take out the stuff they don't think is important, okay? And they modify things, and that's what Denver said. They've, they've changed the constellations, and I've felt that it's my job to restore them. So anyway, there it is. But, but my point of my story is this. The Lord could have told me, when I said, I need something solid, he could have just brought it to mind. The Holy Ghost bring things to mind. He could have said, don't you remember your paper where you quoted that scripture and you said it has to be instruments of cruelty? And I would have said, oh yeah, thank you. Yes, great, thank you. That's what I call just answering it. Instead, he has me go change put in hyphens in all these words. And my, point, my story is, they tell, he, he tests our faith all the time. Will we do what we're told, even if we think it's stupid? And if we will obey the promptings, and if he says, ask the person not to on the bus next to you, and if you say, well, that's stupid, there's no chance he's going to want to just do it. Uh, amazing yeah. things happen. So that's my little story. That just happened this week, and that's in the paper now. And not all those details, just the, I, I actually made a picture of the spear, and uh, that was actually added, I think, the day after the paper came out, but it needed to be there. So uh, it is now probably, a, it's a quarter to, uh, I guess there's no more, does anybody have a really quick question or are we done? I have a quick one, John, uh, of course, but we're talking about the pattern or the Venus cycle or the pattern too. That's where the pentagram comes from, right? Because that is the shape and design with all of those ratios that you're talking about. Exactly. To... If, I'm not sure it's the only source of the, uh, of, and I prefer to call it the lesser, there's the greater seal of Solomon and the lesser seal of Solomon, but unfortunately, after Solomon did the righteous stuff, he goes off and starts witchcraft. And so, so witchcraft has it. And they often, I associate the word pentagram more with what their, their version of it. But yes, if you, if you draw the orbit, the, the very picture I showed you in that, if you draw, uh, yeah, there you go. There's one. 
that's even too, that's pretty fancy. Uh, if you just, without all of the loops, yeah, the one down at the bottom, if you just, if you just make a, a, a dot where they line up, when I said they line up five times in eight years, just draw five dots, you will, you will, the five dots will be the points on the uh, five-pointed star at the bottom. And, and uh, if you look at the, the, the bottom, if the first point is the one at the very bottom, then the second point will be, over, oh, I'm pointing, but you can't see mine. It'll be the one at the uh, uh, 10 o'clock position because see, it's one and three fifths. It'll go around one time and then one, two, three fifths around. And those are connected by a line. So if you connect the lines in the order that they line up, it will draw this star. Yes. That was a long and, way to say. Long way so, to say. Yes. And so, to despite what uh, the counterfeits would say of this pantog uh, the pentagram being satanic or whatever, of course, the adversary always has his counterfeits, right? But well, this is and he copies. He almost never does anything original. He copies the real thing, and then it messes everybody up because now the good guys don't want to see. I don't want to call it a pentagram. Anyway, yeah, he 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 messes stuff up. Go ahead, finish your your thought. Yep, yep, that that was it. Yeah, yeah. So there's always a true side. See, in astronomy, we're just sort of like taught. I mean, it's literally, they're atheists. They don't believe in God. But they know that astrology is of the devil. <laughs> you know, they, you know, and so as an astronomer, I come out, I mean, they actually all signed a petition that there is, cannot possibly be anything to us. And they've never studied it. They have no idea what they're talking about. But they're just sure there can't be anything. So I have come from that background. And so what do I end up doing? Something that looks to a lot of people a whole lot like astrology, because it says there's planetary calendars. And it's when they line up. And, and I keep trying to say it's just a clock. It's not making you do anything. It's not, I, to me, in the work I'm doing, I don't have anywhere where I say it influences you. Uh, just really quick on that. I say it's like you're looking at your watch. And you could watch some, you could observe somebody every day. And he looks at his watch and he runs and eat lunch. And you might say, aha, that lunch is making, that uh, watch is making him, it's influencing him to go eat lunch. And I'm saying, no, no, there's no influence. It's, it's, it's a clock and it's lunchtime. Now... <laughs> It turns out there really may be an influence, and I just don't know about it because I haven't studied astrology. But the stuff I do is just clocks, and so I I try to just limit it to that. And you can see how much there is just in the clocks. So with that, let's stop. We're way past we're past time. We'll pick up there next next week. All right, and to remind everybody to, as always, for the new people that are on, uh, this is on the Restoration Archives. This has been recorded, and it will be on the Restoration Archives. It's under Regional Conferences, and you'll see all of John's classes there. So look for, thank you, John, as always, and look forward to seeing you all next week. Okay, thanks. Okay, <laughs> bye. Bye.